to go ahead and introduce myself to everybody here today. I'm going to load up my screen. Hopefully, you guys can see this here in a minute. But um, let me know if you guys are you guys able to see this, Sarah? Maybe you can confirm that oh, you're yeah. seeing uh, my screen. Yeah, I can all see right. it. Cool. Great. Well, um, yeah, thank you all for for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we're seeing with COVID-19 and how it's impacting enterprise contact centers. Um, my name's Jeff Kerchick. I'm the head of sales for NextCaller. I'm sure many of you are familiar with NextCaller, but uh, just a brief introduction on who we are. We focus on uh, anti-validation specifically, but it's for, uh, basically a fraud and authentication product for contact centers, helping to uh, understand whether or not a call is being spoofed. And uh, primarily we work with financial institutions, insurance companies, um, travel and hospitality and so on. And we have some unique insight into what call patterns are looking like within our customer base. And that's why I think some of the research we're going to be sharing today is pretty interesting. Um, we're able to not only see spikes of traffic, you know, how many people are calling their bank today versus last week or next week, uh, but we're also able to see within those traffic patterns uh, what percentage of calls we deem to be risky and what we might associate with potential fraudulent activity. And we've seen spikes in that as well. So as we, we've been tracking in, uh, all of this stuff really since the beginning of the stay at home orders, and we wanted to share some of our research with you. But obviously COVID has been a pretty crazy time for everybody. Uh, for myself personally, uh, Next Caller is based in New York City. That's where I've been living for the last near seven years. And I, I think it was March 15th, it was a Sunday, picked up all my things and left the city very spontaneously. And I've been in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, about you know four and a half hours away ever since then. But I remember when I packed up my things to go that I kind of thought at the time that I'd be gone for a couple weeks. You know, nobody really uh, knew what to expect. And it's been a constantly evolving chain of information. And because of that, consumers are behaving in ways that are erratic. Um, when I say erratic, I don't mean that it's, um, you know, bad behavior, but it's, it, it errs from normal behavior. It's very hard to predict behavior right now uh, because information is constantly changing. So I'm going to talk to you about what we're seeing. And if we look on the next slide here, you'll see, first and foremost, we're just going to start with customer concern. Um, we have uh, actually been commissioning some of our own research. So in addition to looking at traffic patterns amongst our customer base, we actually have also uh, commissioned some consumer facing research to understand what are consumer attitudes towards uh, basically customer service, interacting with their financial institutions and things like that. And we were pretty, well, I wouldn't say we're surprised, but 80% of people are worried that they will face future COVID related health or financial loss. So this is probably not surprising in addition to the obvious uh, health concerns when you have a pandemic and a, and a basically a disease that is spreading so rapidly, people are worried about getting sick. But in addition to those concerns, people are worried about uh, losing their job, they're worried about the economy slowing down and they're, they're going to lose money in the economy. Uh, we saw that there was a huge stock market dip and crash at the beginning of all of this that seems to have been recovering uh, pretty nicely, but uh, it's, it's very uncertain what the future holds, especially if there's going to be a second wave as some experts are predicting in the fall. Um, so people are very worried about health related and financial loss. And that's, that's uh, resulting in uh, some, some uh, different behavior. It, it really shows how much fear and anxiety in general plays into consumer behavior. And you're about to see that as we, we look into some of the, the next slides and we start looking at the call traffic and how it's been um, changing over time, you'll notice that there's been uh, some really, really, uh, erratic activity in terms of call volumes. So this chart, uh, just for a frame of reference, and you'll see this footnoted at the bottom, but 
week one corresponds to the start of the national stay at home orders. So that was March 16th. That was actually the day after uh, I left New York City, ironically. It sounds like it seems in retrospect, it seemed like a good day to have uh, picked up my things and, and have left. Um, but you'll notice that it, 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 there's some dips in the, it, it, and it ebbs and flows over time and it gets as high as a 25% increase in call traffic uh, that we see across our customer base. And that happens in week five. And uh, don't worry, I'm about to explain why, why these, dips and, uh, these dips and these peaks are occurring. But this is just to give you a picture of how week over week, uh, the volume changed so much over time. And there was a huge correlation, we think, with uh, things that were going on uh, in the world. And we'll talk through that now. But, you know, first and foremost, the call traffic increase, um, you know, corresponds with the initial stay-at-home orders across the United States. So in week one, you'll see that there's this big spike. Um, and you know, what, what, happen, what happens there is, um, you know, basically that uh, people are starting to get concerned about, you know, travel plans that they have, or maybe they have certain deliveries and things that they're trying to, uh, to get in order. Um, there's a little bit of a dip after that, but you'll see that like, as we go, as you go from left to right, generally speaking, the trend that you'll notice is that the peaks are occurring when we are in anticipation of a new event that is about to occur. So for example, with the stimulus checks uh, that were coming out and in anticipation of those coming out, there were a lot of phone calls. People had a lot of questions about, about those checks, when they were going to receive them. And the actual peak that we noticed was um, in week five, and it was the date, the specific date when those checks were issued, when we saw the most phone calls across our entire uh, customer base. Um, so, you know, the times where the, where you have the dips unsurprisingly are when there's really no new news, so to speak. Um, so dips really correlated with, uh, lulls in the news cycle and peaks correlated with major events like stimulus checks or other news announcements like, um, the CARES Act becoming law, uh, and things like that. Um, I think there was a, a time when 6.6 .6 million people filed for unemployment. And uh, what ensued from that was a huge spike in call volume. Because again, when you have people that, you know, this massive increases in unemployment, there's more consumer anxiety, people that are worried about getting their financial, uh, you know, things and affairs in order. Um, so that's kind of what we were seeing. Uh, you know, people might be calling at different times because maybe their car loan or their, their mortgage, uh, certain, you know, certain payments that they owe, maybe they can't afford anymore. So they have increased anxiety about trying to figure out a way to work with their banks. Um, we have all sorts of different theories about what might be going on, but generally speaking, the trend is that you're going to see big spikes in anticipation of some sort of event that causes consumer anxiety and big lulls when the news cycles slowed down a little bit um, and people have maybe diverted their focus towards, uh, towards other things. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move us over to the next slide. Um, back to consumer concern. So um, I'm going to maybe even talk a little bit about my own experience uh, dealing with uh, financial institutions myself. But what's, what I thought was pretty interesting in this data is that 32% of people when we did our research, believed that they had already been targeted for fraud. And that actually increased to 39% over time. So at the end of the nine weeks of our research, um, this went up pretty significantly. And that's a, that's a pretty big number. One in three people, even at the beginning of this, uh, at three weeks in, had believed that they had already been targeted for fraud. And keep in mind, targeted doesn't mean that fraud has been perpetrated. It just means that people feel that they might be under attack, that people might be digging up information about them. And I know that from, from my own experience, this was certainly true for me. I was actually targeted for fraud twice um, over this period of time. And it was kind of anxiety inducing um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, well, 
yeah, maybe these are kind of funny stories, but I, on, on my bank account, I had a, it was actually a British maternity website that somebody had um, spent a hundred dollars on. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I didn't have a hard time explaining to Bank of America that that wasn't me. Um, I'm not shopping on a on British maternity websites for anything that I need right now. Um, and then I think the other one was a uh, an issue with um, uh, some e-commerce site that I've never heard of, and somebody was ordering like protein shakes or something. So these were kind of very, you know, weird uh, circumstances that I had to deal with. Um, calling in, uh, w w the reason it was causing so much anxiety though is because a couple reasons. One is that calling into the call center was very difficult. Um, Enterprise contact centers are staffed in specific locations. Um, they have a certain set of protocol that they've set up. And truth be told, even though there's a lot of disaster planning for a lot of these large contact centers, a global pandemic that requires people to work from home, that was not something that a lot of people were really prepared for. And getting uh, you know, the safety of your employees, getting them to work at a work from home environment when they're used to coming into an office, that was pretty challenging. And staffing was very difficult for people. A lot of agents, you know, they're, maybe they didn't want to work or getting them to work from home, they were shorter staffed. So waiting on hold when you're dealing with a fraudulent scenario, um, that's, you know, that's anxiety inducing. You're on the phone for an hour, you're trying to get on the phone with an agent. Um, in one of my experiences, the investigations were really backed up. It took them about three weeks to issue me a credit for this fraudulent charge. And that alone, you know, checking back on it, you know, seemingly every day causes uh, some anxiety. So the staffing and, and amongst all this and the pressure really mounted up. Um, and I had a couple personal experiences that were challenging. The other thing that's challenging is that for some people, they're moving to different places because of this. And I'm one of those people. Um, I uh, went from New York City to Massachusetts. And so the replacement cards I needed and even having a debit card shipped to me, I needed to have that shipped to an address that these people had never heard of. And that alone is a, generally speaking, what is perceived to be a risky transaction when somebody wants to have a new credit card issued to a location that's not the one that's on file, that raises red flags for banks. And it should, because that's what fraudsters do. They say, send me a credit card to my address and you know, I'm going to pick it up here and I'm going to start using it. Um, so there's this uh, more rigorous authentication that's even required and, and that just compounds to all of this because it's even more time that you need to spend on the phone with agents getting what, you know, what, you're, what you're trying to get. Um, in the case of one of the banks that I work with uh, or one of the banks that I'm a customer of, it's one of the, probably the largest bank in the United States, their call centers were actually shut down for periods of time. Um, and I'm, I won't name names here, but this is a, a very large bank that everybody's familiar with. And on the weekends, they were not even taking phone calls. And I, I think that just goes to show how big of a problem this was at first, that people really were not ready for this. The idea that, you know, you might have fraud on your credit card and that you can't even get on the phone with somebody uh, or speak to somebody and you have to wait several days to do that because of staffing concerns um, just really goes to show how much of a... Um, how much rigmarole really people had to go through to try to manage the situation. Um, you know, we see here 52% were more concerned than usual about fraud uh, due to COVID. And again, this is unsurprising. I mean, most people, it sounds like, are aware of the general premise that fraudsters will take advantage of stressful situations. And I think when people are stressed out, uh, they tend to get in a place of anxiety where they start thinking about worst case scenarios. And this is, this is one of them, that you might have fraud. In addition to the way that this is impacting many people financially, organically, people are concerned that uh, bad actors will make it even worse for them. And I think that's generally um, unsurprising. Um, and then last but not least, we saw nearly half of people reported an increase in phone calls, texts, and emails from unknown sources. And um, this is the type of thing that we generally see. You know, you'd like to think that these fraudsters have some sort of cutoff point to their, you know, in their immorality, but they really don't. Um, I remember, you know, uh, several years ago, it was probably, you know, maybe like five years ago, my grandfather passed away 
And there are people who literally uh, crawl through the obituaries to figure out who's recently deceased and who are their widows. And they make phone calls to those widows and, you know, pretend to be published clearinghouse and that they've won, you know, $10 million and they just need to pay the taxes or whatever. And this happened to my grandmother. Somebody called her uh, pretending to be publisher's clearinghouse and, and saying that she had won all this money. Uh, and they knew that she was, you know, grieving my grandfather's death or whatever. And, you know, they thought that she'd be a good target for this. Um, my grandmother, I think I've tried to explain to her many times what I do for a living. And I don't know if she really, you know, fully understands it. But um, this was one scenario where that came in handy. And I was able to explain to her, hey, you know, never uh, accept phone calls from people that you don't know. You know, you can call them back if, if you're concerned about it, you know, being the person that you think it is. But, um, you know, long story short, people are seeing these increases in this outbound calling activity uh, where they're getting the phone call from fraudsters or unknown sources. And um, that's bad news, uh, usually. Moving right along here, we're going to start to overlay um, high risk calls with uh, all calls in our research. So, um, you know, you'll see that really in that second week lull where the call traffic went back to normal during that second week, that's, that seems to be when fraudsters started to really pick up the pace. Um, you know, they know uh, when it comes to enterprise contact centers, fraudsters are very well trained in social engineering. And social engineering is really all about understanding the stress level of the agent and um, putting an agent under stress. And, and you'll see here that there's really a pretty interesting correlation where the rise of fraudulent calls is pretty much almost exactly mirrors um, uh, the spikes of normal call behavior, except at the end. Like later on, we see that as things start to get back to normal, fraudsters kind of just go back to their normal habits. But as things are really, uh, as there's this big uptick in call activity, the fraudsters are acting with that. And that's smart on their behalf because they know that agents that are answering the telephone are more empathetic than ever. Okay, so you imagine a scenario where I call in and I'm, you know, I can't pay my auto loan and under normal circumstances, you know, there's a certain way that a bank might behave or react to my plight. But in, in these more unusual circumstances where we all seem to be, you know, in this thing together, um, some of these companies are maybe being a little more lenient, the agents are feeling a little more empathetic. They're also under a lot more fire because they're getting more calls than they can handle. There's shorter staff, right? We've identified that there are less people that are able to answer the phone. We've identified that there are more people making phone calls. Um, so you have like hour long hold times. The agents are trying to work as quickly as possible. And what ha the net effect is that uh, they're going to give away things sometimes that they shouldn't. And Fraudsters know that, and they know that this is a time where they can exploit that through social engineering. They can ask certain questions, get information that you know, they might not be able to get otherwise. And we're seeing that here, uh, the correlation and the spikes of the high-risk calls with, with all calls, which we found to be pretty interesting. Um, this slide, I think, gives you more of the key takeaways um, of our findings. So. You know, like I said before, we saw a steady rise um, in high risk calls in the first three weeks. Uh, despite that de decline in week two, um, it felt like fraudsters knew that this was a new opportunity. And so for the first few weeks, you're seeing these, um, you know, these big spikes and the rate of high risk calls was elevated above normal traffic for the first five weeks. And that really leads up to these stimulus checks and there's all sorts of fraud that people were really worried about, not only with the PPP loans, but also with the stimulus checks. And so um, it's not surprising that we would see bad actors making phone calls in the time frame that really leads up to all of this. Um, high risk calls did not always mirror normal traffic spike behavior, but it was often a leading indicator. So in other words, um, if we saw an uptick in some of these more fraudulent calls, it was generally a, a precursor to what we might expect as far as our overall call traffic. 
Um, and then last but not least, by week nine, as normal traffic began to subside, high-risk call traffic has once again begun to accelerate. Um, it's actually something that we are still trying to figure out is like why that might be. Um, but, you know, there seems to be an ebb and flow to this and um, it will be interesting to see as events unfold, um, you know, what, more, what the data continues to tell us. Um, if we start moving into just making this banking specific, so looking at all high risk traffic versus banking. So what you'll see here in the brown, I think that's brown or like a crimson color here, we have just financial services high risk calls and the uptick that we saw for financial services customers. And then we looked at all calls. And so the, the moral of the story here is that everything we just talked about is, is, is exacerbated for financial institutions. And again, this is probably um, unsurprising because financial institutions are dealing with the brunt of consumer anxiety. Um, so whether it's PPP loans, whether it's with stimulus checks, whether it's with people who have auto or home loans or people who are generally frustrated or anxious about their finances, people like me who are ha seem to have fraud that's running rampant on their accounts and needing to call in, um, it's not surprising that we see um, a general uptick with financial institutions and all calls, but also because there's more opportunity for fraud there that we would see a larger uptick in riskier phone calls um, uh, for this specific uh, vertical. Um, the key takeaways we mentioned here on the side that financial institutions were even more affected, uh, peaking at a 50% increase in high risk calls. And of course, the banks issuing uh, PPP loans saw unique spikes correlated to PPP loan events and news updates in weeks seven to nine. Um, so we anticipate that uh, this trend will probably continue because people's financial uh, anxieties are, do not seem to be cured by what's going on. States were reopening briefly. And what we saw in the reopening of certain states is that they're now, a lot of them are shutting down again. Um, so these financial anxieties will probably continue and we should probably expect more spikes to occur as a result. And I think that's probably uh, where we are heading. Um, looking at the current events timeline here, so this really marries up everything that we have discussed so far. So looking at all calls versus high risk calls and correlating uh, everything with the events that have been going on. So uh, traffic spikes began with the stay at home orders. Um, in the early weeks of confusion, the fraud accelerated. The fraudsters were um, taking advantage of a situation that they knew was a good situation that could be rife uh, for fraud. Um, normal traffic waned with uh, scarce new info. So basically when there were lulls in the news cycle, we saw the, the traffic would kind of come back to reality. Um, imminent news of relief drove all the traffic higher. So any sort of imminent news of something, whether it was a stimulus check, and again, the date of the checks themselves, I forget what day, I think it was sometime, uh, um, it was like mid-April, um, uh, mid I believe, April 15th, I feel like was the day where we, we saw more calls than we've ever seen in the history of Next Caller. Um, that was a pretty, uh, a pretty stressful day for the company to say the least. Um, the highest spikes in traffic uh, correlated to major stimulus news and events. So we covered that. And um, a second wave of normal and high risk call traffic spikes were correlated to news announcements and events surrounding the PPP loans. I'm gonna move on to the next part. I'm gonna talk a little bit about actually some of the uh, specific types of fraud that we would see or expect to see, but um, there's, so many different fraud vectors right now, and even more so than you might usually expect. Um, and because of that, managing customer experience has become more important than ever. You know, especially like we talked about agents being under more stress. They want to be as helpful as possible. Um, it's more important than ever to be thinking about these things. But, you know, call spoofing is one of the more common tactics that we see. 
Um, and when we see people spoofing numbers, it, it's not always uh, people that are spoofing the phone number of their target. Sometimes people are just spoofing a random Annie. And the, and the reason that people will do that is because they want to just be anybody but themselves. So if they're spoofing just a random phone number, uh, they still have to identify as the person whose account they're taking over uh, if, because it's not the, that person's phone number, but at least now they're undetectable. Um, and we see a pretty good split. We see a lot of times customer uh, fraudsters, excuse me, are spoofing the, the Annie of the customer whose account they're trying to compromise. Other times it's random. Um, another fraud vector that we see a lot of is something called Annie trawling. So what this is, is when somebody calls into a call center spoofing random phone numbers. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to see how the IVR treats those spoofed calls. Because if I call Bank of America uh, as a customer today, it's gonna greet me by name in the IVR. Um, but if somebody else calls Bank of America who's not a customer, it's going to treat them differently. It's going to ask them, you know, for their account number or to identify themselves. But you can tell that somebody's a customer or not just based on the way that the IVR speaks back to you. So what this does is it creates a scenario where fraudsters can essentially figure out who is a customer and what phone number are they using on their account. And they're doing that just by spoofing random numbers, like a block of phone numbers. And why are they doing that? Well, if they can figure out who your customer is and they know their phone number, what they can do is start interacting directly with that phone number or that start text messaging that person saying, Hey, it's us at bank of America. Uh, we noticed fraud on your account. Call us at this number and whatever. Um, and, and you know where this goes, where this goes is that people fall for it they really think that their bank is calling them or reaching out to them and they give up information that they shouldn't give up. Um, so we're seeing a lot of this, obviously the PPP loans, you know, people setting up fake businesses and getting these loans. You have issues with, I think the number was like $1.2 billion of, uh, uh, of money that was given out to, in stimulus checks to dead people. Um, it's a lot of money to people that can't spend it, you know, and, and with that, you have people that might be filing on behalf of people who are recently deceased, you know, they're no different than these people who are calling my grandmother, they're looking in the obituaries, and they're filing to get these payments um, on behalf of other people. So, you know, it is really, um, I don't want to be too charged in this presentation, but it is really disgusting. I think what some of, you know, what some of these people will resort to at the expense of others. Um, uh, all the while, they're quite talented, clearly, at what, at what they do. Um, but yeah, we talk a little bit about that here. Um, you know, uh, a lot of this stuff, I think, speaks for itself, but this is a lot of the type of stuff that we've been seeing that's going on. Um, you know, people that might be fishing for information, um, even just interacting in the IVR, fishing um, for certain information within an IVR uh, or even at the agent level. Or like I said, they might get the through trawling and then fish for that data directly at the consumer level. Um, you know, none of some of this stuff's not new, like stealing checks or credit cards out of a mailbox. But um, you know, people know that everyone's at home, they're getting uh, their mail at home now um, all the time. So, uh, you know, this is a good time to be fishing through and grabbing things. You know, I got a new, I had to get a couple of card, new cards issued to me. Fortunately, I don't even have a mailbox where I live. So um, uh, I'm a little less vulnerable to that, but that's something that we see out there. Uh, people opening new lines of credit, people that are creating new fake businesses. These are like the people that create the robo dialing, you know, they pretend to be a VoIP company and whatever, and they set up a new fake business. It's the same type of thing, but these people are actually getting loans for their, you know, their fake business, um, filing fake tax returns. Um, this was all going on during tax season. Um, so again, you overwhelm the system. People have to work a lot more quickly. Um, filing fake, fake tax returns is, uh, is an easy way to make money. And uh, the famous uh, former CIA most wanted cyber criminal, Brett Johnson, this is how he made his living uh, starting out his fraud career, was filing fake tax returns. He would do several a day um, and would make a lot of money just doing that. 
um, filing for unemployment on other people's behalf and other benefits. This is a good time for that as well. Those offices are overwhelmed. Where we've seen more people unemployed now um, than we've ever seen. So um, this is a good time for people to be taking advantage of overwhelmed systems, and that's precisely what they're doing. We're getting close to the end, but as we do that, I want to just pivot back to where does this leave us, and like what are the consumer expectations for us moving forward? So. Um, you know, during periods of anxiety and confusion, people prefer to speak with a human. And I always joke, like I'm the worst example um, from, for our clients. I, I don't like to interact with IVRs personally. I really don't. Um, I zero out most of the time. I'm, bad, uh, I'm a bad customer. But a lot of people, it sounds like, are kind of uh, losing their patience. They don't want to, they don't trust uh, working with a chatbot or an automated system. They want to work with a human. It's actually kind of ironic um, because uh, arguably the human element of all this actually makes them more prone to fraud that a human being could be collecting their information. And we actually, um, I did a podcast with Simon Marsh on from Nuance. And um, I'm sure a lot of you know Simon because uh, he's part of CFCA. But when I asked him to predict, you know, future fraud trends, he really thought that we'd have to worry about the agents themselves, you know, the agents um, committing fraud within the, in the contact center. So that's something to consider, but consumers don't seem to see it that way. They seem to have an agent on the phone. They like that human element. Um, agents are under pressure to maintain customer service expectations. Um, increased agent caseloads, limit bandwidth, and contribute to lapses in agent judgment. So again, this is a supply and demand thing. You have less agents, you have more phone calls. Um, they're stressed. They have opportunity to think through things. They're trying to faster. Um, and fraudsters are, you know, uh, ready to regulate agents to bypass policies and security procedures. Um, you know, people are on hold for longer periods of time. So when they get on the phone, they're more frustrated. Um, so, you know, this is just a real recipe for disaster. You know, it can be, um, you know, you have angrier people on the phone. They're less patient. The agents have less time. They're trying to be more empathetic. I mean, this is really the perfect recipe for, uh, for fraudsters. Um, the last thing here with consumer patients uh, we're going to cover is so basically, you have less opportunity right now to make your customers, uh, to satisfy your customers. And that's gravely concerning because businesses are struggling enough as is. I mean, we've seen stories already of major retailers who are shutting their doors, you know, companies that we all love that we'll probably never see again. Um, and, you know, airlines and hotels, uh, we're worried about them, right? But People are, as much as people are, uh, un, I think, largely understanding of what businesses are going through, 72% um, of people are reporting having the same or less patience for a bad experience since COVID began. Um, and so what you'll see here on the right side is that 49% of people say that two or three bad experiences, they would not work with that brand anymore. 59% say it would take several experience um, and 80% say a business's response to their COVID needs will impact their future loyalty. And that last statistic I think is pretty important, probably more so than the other two, because what consumers are basically telling us is that how you, how you react to me as a consumer or a customer in my, in my biggest time of need and in your biggest time of stress tells me a lot about your character. That seems to be the takeaway. I might be um, putting words in the mouth of some people, but I think what, what, what this means is that people are really valuing this response because they know it means something. And we've seen a lot of brands that I, in my opinion, are handling this really as best as they possibly can. Um, I'm a frequent traveler. I, I'm one of those people who's annoying about their status with airlines and hotels and who freaks out about making their status every year. And I was worried about, you know, what would happen. I'm not flying. I'm not, you know, I'm not staying in hotels. Um, I have, 
uh, different programs, you know, that I, I have credit cards that I pay for, like what happens to all of this stuff. And I think the airlines and hotels have done as much as they can do. They've basically said, you know, we'll, we'll give you credits for your flights. We'll give you refunds for your flights. We'll extend your status for a year. If you have a lounge access, we extend that for a year. Like they're doing pretty much everything that you could possibly ask them to do. Um, and I know in my experience, I've had to call and uh, deal with them in different ways. And um, for the most part, it's been a good experience. And I think I appreciate that. But I also had a concert that was canceled and it took me four months to get a refund. You know, they, they didn't even announce the cancellation. Um, I'll never work with that brand ever again. You know, that's, that's a terrible way to treat people during a pandemic is to not even announce that you've canceled an event and to be coy about issuing refunds for months. And this is the case, unfortunately, for a lot of people. They have money that they have not been refunded for various events until they get rescheduled. Um, you know, I personally, I know that I have money that's out in the ether for things that I paid for. I was going to go to the Olympics this year. I have tickets for the Olympics that have not been refunded. And for me personally, um, my response is, you know, I don't have much patience for that. I, I, it, it's uh, something that a lot of consumers are, they are not going to shop again with people if they are not showing uh, a level of empathy uh, that is um, ref accurately reflects the, 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 the current situation. I'm gonna just get to our last slide here and just talk about um, preparing for the next wave and what we can do. And as fraud professionals, I think that you guys probably already know the tips for consumers. But if you want, the, these slides will be sent out if you have family members or friends or even people in your own organization where you want to just share this slide with them to help protect themselves, but also to help protect the companies that you represent. Um, these are some good tips. Um, you're gonna be getting phone calls from people that are saying they're your bank or people that you know, and don't trust that. You know, you need to be more cautious than, than you normally are. Don't reveal PII over the phone. If you're unsure about somebody that called you, call them back. You know, most often you're not gonna be getting phone calls in these situations with people asking you for sensitive information. Um, you know, be aware that people can phone numbers. You might see the caller ID of your bank. It doesn't mean it's them. Um, Frequently review account information online. I've been doing that. I've been checking my all my accounts every single morning. And that's that's not what I normally do. I usually check like once a week, maybe, or when I have to pay my bill, I'll run through my statement and see if everything looks right, make sure there's no fraud. Um, that's usually what I do. But I've been checking every single day and I'm glad that I have because I've had two uh, instances of fraud and uh, a third instance of uh, I accidentally paid a credit card that doesn't exist. I'm glad that I, uh, I, I caught that because I would like that money back. So sometimes checking these things frequently can be good. Um, yeah, and then tips for businesses. You know, anti-match calls when you can. Use anti-validation to secure your anti-match. I mean, this is the next caller sales pitch, so I apologize for giving it, but it's more important than ever to be doing this stuff. Um, it actually helps with the burden of the increase in calls. You know, you're having more people call, you have more verification you need to do, you have less agents. Well, if you can passively authenticate people, that makes life a lot easier for everybody. Um, avoid over-reliance on KBA and OTP. KBA doesn't work. Criminals know the answers to knowledge-based authentication questions four out of five times, according to Gartner. And yet people still use this as their primary form of authentication. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Um, one-time passcodes. The uh, NIST recommended getting rid of one-time passcodes many years ago, and again, they're still used frequently. I think every time I call Amazon, I have to I have to do a one-time passcode before I can even get on the phone with an agent. Um, again, these are measures that are frictional for callers. They don't work a lot of the time. There's ways around them uh, using, you know, SMS forwarding, number porting, man-in-the-middle attacks, things like that. Um, you know, try to be predictive. You know, you know, you can track what consumers are doing. You can tie behavior to their ante. Be predictive. Try to help them, meet them where they're at. So these are just some of the tips that we, we, we would give. But we do believe there's another wave of this coming. The trends show that uh, there's, a, there's an ebb and flow to this. And there's, you know, recently there has been a lot of news 
that would indicate that we're about to see another spike. Um, there's been talk of more stimulus checks. Um, we're seeing more states that are now going back to closing, they're reversing. Um, and people are worried that even in New York City, which seems to be getting on the right track, that we might see a huge second wave of this in the fall. Um, there's a lot of debate even about the seasonality of this disease that we don't understand whether uh, uh, there could be a huge uh, re resurgence of this because of the change in the seasons. So be prepared for that and be planning ahead. Um, we saw a lot of companies that were reactionary to what happened. And now that we have got, kind of got our wits about us, now it's a good time to start being proactive and planning for the worst. Um, we might, the, the worst of this might still be ahead of us and we need to brace for that possibility. Um, so I'm sorry to be uh, a bearer of bad news, and that's not what I like to do. I like to try to be generally a little more upbeat, but we wanted to share what we're seeing. It's pretty interesting stuff. Um, copies of this report will be made available to everybody. Uh, the data is pretty, pretty cool, so feel free to share it with anybody who you see fit. But um, without further ado, I'll turn it over, Sarah, to you and uh, see if there's any Cute uh, questions that I can answer. <laughs> 